All right, well, the first thing I want to start with, Melanie and Ian, is your reaction to the autopsy results, which came out just the other day concerning your uncle, Melanie. Were you guys surprised at all? What did you think when you heard the news? Um, it was relieving, but we weren't surprised. We, we knew that it would be natural causes. We had no reason to think anything otherwise. Um, I think it was just a comfort, like finally, like this part is over and it's one more stepping stone to just keep revealing truth. And then, you know, the second half of the day, they open it up and say, well, it's still under investigation again. It just, it feels like every time we, we get a little bit of good news, there's a little bit of drag to that too. But overall, just relief and um, comfort to be in the right direction. You mentioned that they still said they're investigating and there's going to be people watching that still don't believe those results or say there's something yeah. more here. What do you say to them? I mean, you know, you see, you, you post truth out there and people have already made up their minds and decided. Um, Ian made a, a bad joke, like, well, did they test for all the invisible poisons? Like it's, it's, People will still think whatever speculation or rumors or whatever they want to believe, even when it's right in front of their face. And I was talking about this too. I was like, you know, when Tylee and JJ show up, you know, again and are you're here again, I don't know if people would even believe it. They'd still, you know, go on with their own, um, you know, still cold. It's still, they've done something bad. And it's it, a lot of people already made up their minds. And we just want to, come on and share what we do know and share truth and hopefully we you know keep getting opportunities where where people will be open to that and be able to listen so melanie alex was your uncle and uh you know from the beginning a lot of people have thrown questions out there as to why he died was this big a coincidence was this just a big coincidence did you from the beginning think it was or did in the back of your mind did you think there might be something more here there was absolute shock um, when I got a phone call from Zulema and she was telling me, um, I had spoken with Alex earlier that day and he had seemed okay, but I knew that week before he was having trouble with, um, he was overall a pretty healthy guy, but stubborn, like wouldn't ever, you know, put a bandaid on if he's bleeding everywhere and, um, you know, wouldn't do regular checkups. He just was a tough guy. And uh, when he told me we were going to, meet up at one point and I was going to bring him some of his stuff because he had moved down to be with Sloma and he then said hey you know let's not meet up halfway let's wait I'm not feeling very good and that was big for him to say that because he never would um, say that he wasn't feeling good so the week before he said you know I just kind of have tightness in my chest or having trouble breathing he said he had bent down to get a water bottle and it took the breath out of him and you know I Zulema was absolutely worried and was like, you need to get to the doctor. And he was like, no, 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 I'm fine. And the morning of, um, it was really kind of, I, I called him probably every other day um, once he wasn't in Arizona anymore, or in, sorry, in Idaho. And the morning um, I'd called him, Ian was at work. And he was somebody I could kind of just, you could tell him anything, he's like a vault. And I was just openly telling him about, you know, things in my new marriage, things that were, you know, challenging or things that were going really well. And he was just my best friend at that point. And he shared some things with me that were, um, I just felt like, write them down when he started talking to me. I don't know why I felt impressed to do that. But like he, what? Just said, yeah. he said, Melanie, the most important thing in your marriage is to be loving, be supportive and be patient. And he kept repeating that, and I was like, and I need to, I need to remember that always. Like, it always comes back to that. And, you know, it was his last words to me, and I didn't know that. But it was really just special, like, that I felt, you know, like, hey, write that down. And he just said, you know, everything's going to be fine. And, um, you know, just keep moving forward in faith. You're going to have your kids back soon, and everything's going to work out. And just, you know, just go on faith. And I, Later that evening, I get a call from Zulema, and I think I was excited. I started telling her about my day, or um, and then it just shifted, and I, Ian was there, and I kind of just went into a shock for a little bit, and I fell to the floor, and I just felt all the feelings of losing, losing such a close friend, and I hadn't been very close with Alex um, 
most of my life, I was closer with um, my aunt and even my other uncle, but after starting to have challenges in my, in my last marriage, Alex was a truck driver and you could just call him, he always answered. And uh, he would just talk and let you talk to him. And I, I do talk a lot. And he would let me just vent and he would say, he'd never would put somebody down or judge them. He would just say, well, here's how you handle that situation. And um, like nobody could do any wrong in his eyes. He just, he just uh, was very positive and somebody that was so influential to be around when I'm going through the hardest thing and missing my, my four children. Yeah. Uh, he just picked me up every day. How's Zulema doing? Um, I love Zulema with all my heart. I feel like it's been really hard. She hasn't been able to really mourn and grieve the loss of her husband. And, um, you know, all the accusations going out there, she doesn't really feel um, ready to come forward and share that story. And I respect that um, or, or share her feelings on everything. And she's still just trying to get through every day and missing her husband. Um, but, but she's doing okay. I want to kind of back up to to hear a little bit about each of you guys because there there has been some li limited information that's come out about each of you. But would you mind just telling me about yourself, how you guys met, how you ended up in Idaho and then back in Arizona? Mm -hmm. Ian, could you start? Yeah, absolutely. So I uh, I grew up in Southern California, um, and I moved to I got married in 2010, moved to Idaho in 2011. Uh, with my ex-wife Natalie, we had two kids together. Um, so right now they're nine and they're seven, Max and Lily. Um, miss and you know they're fantastic kids. They, you know, I, I miss them a lot right now, and you know, I, I would love to get them down here to Arizona. But um, so yeah, we were there with our kids. I started school um, at BYU Idaho. I never finished. Um, just work, school, and, and being a dad was too much, and I just figured I'd work. So, um, Natalie and I hit, you know, hit our ninth anniversary and on our ninth anniversary, she asked for a divorce. Um, and so we, you know, we worked our way through that, uh, got, you know, or that started in March of 2019. Um, and, you know, got all wrapped up in July and then, um, yeah, I, I, I decided I, you know, try to jump back into dating a little bit. Talk to uh, you know, I was talking to my friends and and you know, you know my my family and just kind of saying like you know I want to get back out and meet people. I, it wasn't really my goal to get to find you know a wife. I just wanted to find people to hang out with and you know at the same time I I just gone through a really rough divorce. It kind of tore me up and I'm trying to put my life back together and you know maybe looking for a little bit of validation, just somebody to talk to who's not going to judge me and, and you know push me away. So you know I. I um, I downloaded some dating apps and found Melanie on one of them and asked her on a date that day. I figured, you know, I hate talking to people through text. I don't, I don't feel like I communicate well through over text or, you know, it, you know, I can't, I'm sarcastic a lot. And so, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't come across well in text sometimes. So I just wanted to, I feel better meeting people in person. So invited her out to dinner. We um, went to McKenzie and, River. Sorry, what, what month was this Ian? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So this was November. So we, so Melanie, you had moved to Rexburg. Yeah, the first week in November, I moved to Rexburg. So, so you both were already both in the same town together. Right. We were across the street from each other. Yeah, uh, we actually found oh, that out. And you didn't yeah. know that? We didn't even know, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So you went to McKenzie River. Yeah, she, 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 was, she was just, I don't know how to describe it other than she just, every, everything just kind of clicked with her. Um, we'd had so many, so many similar experiences with the way our divorces went. The way the last year of our lives had went, you know, had gone with with uh, with just the struggles, and and uh, we understood each other. Um, you know, I, I found I found no judgment with her, no um, no preconceived notions. She just wanted to get to know me, and you know, we we spent the next you know two days basically just talking constantly. It was. You know, I guess I guess with the the, la the, the previous people I, I dated, it felt like I was trying to make up reasons to continue to date those people. You know, to go on a second date or whatever. But with her, it was just easy. It clicked, and I didn't have to try to do mental gymnastics to justify a second date. And then you got married shortly thereafter, right? Correct. So, um, 
so yeah, one, one of the things that I really loved, um, you know, one of the things that I guess got me that led to us getting married so quickly was our children. Um, I learned that, you know, she had four kids and I, I, you know, I absolutely love that. She, you know, she said she saw my dating profile that I'm, you know, one of the first things I put in, in, in my bio, I guess, is that I'm a dad, you know, and I've got two kids. I love them with all my heart. Um, you know, and I, and I, I want them to be a big part of our lives. And, and, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to have, I didn't want to, I didn't want anybody to be a part of my life that wasn't going to be supportive of my role as a father to my two, ch two children. And it's the same with her. Um, I still haven't had the opportunity to meet her kids yet. And I would, I would, I can't wait, but, uh, seeing her interact with my kids for the first time, you know, we, we came, so we came to Arizona. Um, I came down with my two children to have Thanksgiving with my family and, uh, she came down, um, a few days later and on her way down, she was talking about how she didn't have anybody to go to Thanksgiving with. And so I invited her to come be with my family. It was kind of a spur of the moment thing. And, uh, so she showed up and my kids immediately fell in love with her. They, um, you know, my daughter, she, she can be a little shy, a little standoffish and just immediately was, was attached to Melanie, wanted to, you know, wanted to just take her around and show her everything she'd been doing, play games with her, tell her everything that's on her mind. My daughter doesn't, she has no filter, so she'll just say exactly what she's thinking. <laughs> um, and just to see Melanie interact with my kids, um, it just made me fall really hard, really fast for her because she's just so sweet and good with them. At one point I had gotten out of the car to go run into the gas station on our road trip and Lily said to Ian, don't blow it, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think you blew it. You guys were married shortly thereafter, right? After Thanksgiving? Right, yeah, November 30th. November 30th. We were, it was really fast. And, um, you know, I was in this, you know, battle still with my ex and didn't have my kids with us right then. But we felt um, both ready. We, we pray about decisions together and we, felt, you know, that it was right that we should get married when we did. And, you know, Vegas wedding wasn't dreamy or anything, but our goal was to be sealed in the temple, you know, one day. And so we said, let's do this while we have Max and Lily. And then when we have Braxton, Brighton, Blake, and Breeze too, let's all be together when we have that special day where we can be sealed together. Now, were Alex and Zulema married? Did you guys have a joint wedding or was that separate? So Alex and Zulema had been dating for several months and kind of, Alex was very ready to marry Zulema and she was a little bit like, you know, I'm going to wait till I get an answer. I know I'm supposed to be with you, Alex, but I'm going to wait till it feels like the right time. And they um, had talked about, do you want to get married in Jackson or, um, you know, Las Vegas? And it just so happened when they were, they picked their date and had it more planned than Ian and I did. And, you know, the coincidence of it, of us picking the date right after them wasn't planned or anything. It was just, what what happened and they they were there and we had made the decision in arizona during thanksgiving and we said let's do it and while we're there you know we need a witness and alex and zulema are there and you know this isn't our big wedding day this is just the beginning of our lives together and we'll have that special moment when we're all together as a family okay so they got married the day before you guys did yes i believe so so one so day we got married on the 30th and i think they got married on the 29th and was it uh, just an intimate ceremony for the both of you, like any extended family or, you know, friends, or was it just kind of a small group? Yeah, it was just in, for Ian and I, we had two or three hours. We got a, a dress and a, a tux and got the kids all dressed up and their hair done. And it was a small, um, I think the lucky little wedding chapel, I think right. is where we, um, where we picked. And it's a small room. Um, and it was, it was just very intimate, um, quick, not um, anything crazy or anything, but it was special to us. And then Alex and Zulema just were there as our witnesses. And um, it was just planned last second. We didn't have time to invite a lot of people. It was just a, on a whim decision and felt like it's what we should do. Now, Melanie, were you born and raised in Arizona? I wasn't. So I was born in Utah, but... Um, lived in Phoenix as a baby and then lived in California for a while. And then Seattle is where I spent a lot of time growing up. Um, and your mom unfortunately passed away when you were young, right? Yeah. So we, um, my mom got really sick a couple years after having me. She almost died having me. She had a, um, a deep vein thrombosis, blood clot. Um, 
and our the cox side doesn't really have great genes like we there's a lot of um, my grandpa's had cancer and blood clots and um initially when we heard about um i believe uh, my grandfather was told by the police that um alex they had thought that he had a, a lung clot uh, was the reason for his death initially so that's what we thought this whole time um that you know it kind of runs in the family and that makes sense but um but yeah my i think my parents had a, a rough time when my mom got really sick with type 1 diabetes uh, also with gastroparesis she couldn't have the ability to absorb nutrients and she was in and out of seeing doctors and in and out of hospitals and i think it was hard on my dad i know there was um some infidelity on his part and they tried to work through things and they just couldn't make it work and i spent um a lot of time in the cox home so barry and janice my grandparents they lived in california and i lived with them for a while and uh, my mom was sick and i remember my dad traveling a lot um for for his job and um my mom finally felt like she was healthy enough when we moved to seattle where my dad got a job there and it was just me my mom and my dad my mom couldn't have any more kids and um i was kind of their their baby and uh when i was six um my dad just i remember that's about as far back as i can remember is the night my dad took me and he said we were gonna go get gas and we never came back we left my mom there and he turned the power off he took all of her credit cards he took her planner and just left her there and she was really sick to the point she couldn't really take care of herself and we hid out in a hotel for a couple months and then from then on started a nasty custody battle um, between them and you know as when you're little i just remember just being quiet not really understanding what was going on and um i don't remember what went on in the court process i just remember not seeing my mom a lot and she was she fought as much as she could and i think she got so sick ran out of money and things just weren't you know just in her case and it um i grew up with just you know my my dad and then later my stepmom when my dad got remarried and i heard all manner of things about the Coxes, and I, my dad kind of cut off communication with them. Um, and these were people I grew up with, and I knew they were good people, and I loved them, and it didn't feel right a lot of the lies I was being told about them. But um, my mom later passed away when I was nine. Lori was the one that called and told me the news. She said, "Your mom's in a coma, and she's, you know, she's probably not going to make it." And I remember that phone call and I've always loved and trusted Lori. She's always been somebody that is just so much unconditional love on her end, no judgment, no drama. And I admire her so much. And I don't think I would have wanted to have that phone call by anybody else to have to give me that news. And I remember flying up with my dad who took me to see my mom last time in hospice. Um, she, was, she was out and she didn't come out of her diabetic coma. There was no, um, you know, it wasn't a surprise. My mom was always very sick and on the line of, you know, we don't know how long Stacy's gonna last. And after nine, my age nine and my mom passed, my dad didn't let me talk or see any of that side of the family. And I didn't know why other than he was saying um, all sorts of things about them. And finally, when I was 15, I found my uncle Adam on a radio um, I, I think I Googled him. We had computers at high school and I found him and he was one of my favorite, favorite people in my life that I remember growing up. And, and then it kind of started connecting all those ties that I had gone so, so long from age nine all the way to 15 without. And it's like we jumped right back into it. And uh, for all those years, they didn't have me and they, they tried sending packages and my dad would return them. And I never understood why I just felt something off in my heart. But I, um, no judgment or resentment on you know why my dad did the things he did but I just I wish to this day he would you know just say it for what it is just be real about it because that's how we that's how we grow we go through these experiences and um, Ian and I are that's the most important thing to us like we're not perfect I'm terrible I'm about being nervous on you know national television I'm trying to get better at it and 
it's hard to see all the comments people say about you, but we're just trying. We're trying to just be real and be open about everything now. So was it kind of like Lori raised you after your mom passed? Mainly my grandma Janice. Lori was young um, and kind of, you know, busy with her life, but she'd take me and go do fun things and also my, my, uh, my Aunt Summer and um, my Uncle Adam was, and I wasn't super close with Alex. He, um, I didn't ever get his jokes. He's a comedian and I just was always like, I don't, I, I probably takes me a minute to process like longer than most people. And so I would never really like connect as much with Alex as I did with Adam or, or Lori. But, um, but yeah, they were so important in my life and to not have that growing up and have that confusion of, you know, what happened and why did things go south? And up until three years ago, I didn't know that my dad had been telling everybody this other side of, Hey, your mom died of anorexia and you know, she's mentally ill and, you know, basically made himself look like the hero. I took you away from her and I knew that didn't feel right. And I was like, kind of in shock that, that everybody in the whole world thinks that she dies of died of anorexia and she's not here to tell her story. And I have all of her medical records and all the court documents. And I just, it's hard seeing the same patterns of what happened to my mom now happened in my life where my kids are taken away from me wrongfully and things are said about me that aren't true. But I know my kids know who I am. And my own, my own father is helping my ex-husband right now. And, and they've had my kids at their house and don't tell me. And I just have bullying text messages from my, from my dad. And that's upsetting. I feel like you should love your kid no matter what. If all these false claims, if they were even true, if they really thought I was some crazy and in a cult and done something horrible, shouldn't they just reclaim me with kindness as their, as their daughter and love me anyways? But the fact that these things aren't true, it's, it's absolutely heartbreaking. And I don't have, you know, a good relationship right now where I feel like I can keep them, keep them close in my life right now. I'm kind of just loving them from a distance and letting everything play out. And I don't judge anyone for all the things that they're scared of or confused about because this case is heavy and it's unlike anything. I never thought this would be our lives. Like it's, uh, it's unreal. I, I do want to ask you, um, there have been other reports about your mother's death that somehow Lori may have been tied into it or, or whatever's killing all these other people. Your mom may have been the first victim. Can you address that? Yeah, she died of natural causes. It's on her death certificate, but um, she she had type one diabetes and with gastroparesis with that, like she she went to every type of doctor. She even went and you know went to you know I think she got tested for eating disorders for, for everything she got tested for, and it was so clear what she had. It was so far from anorexia. It was a total manipulation of you know, she's tiny and can't absorb nutrients. And they, he took us and ran with the story of that. And it's hurtful and it's untrue. And she's not here to tell that truth. And, you know, reading through court documents, there are so many things he could have said because we're real and open about our family and we make mistakes. He could have said, you know, true things, but it was mostly just lies about everything. And that's similar to what's happening in my family court case. It's the same pattern. And I think, I think we go through these things to to learn and experience and seeing that same exact thing happen now in my life it's too it's too ironic that it's the same exact patterns 